My name is John Santijano. I am an associate professor of English at Tarrant County College, Trinity River Campus, and today I will be talking about game-based pedagogy. Specifically, we'll be focusing on theory, research, and practice. There we go. And a little bit about myself. Uh, I already spoke about where I teach. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree in education. When I was doing my bachelor's, I focused on the integration of video games with uh, the language acquisition process. Uh, this is a kind of research trend that I continued as I moved forward with my first master's degree, uh, where I focused in language acquisition. I did a uh, an investigation on how language affects students' attitudes. Uh, I'm sorry, on how video games affect students' uh, attitudes towards language acquisition. Uh, and then I took a bit of a detour. I uh, did a master's in English literature. There I focused on uh, Blake and the Caribbean, the intersection uh, between Europe and the Caribbean. Uh, and then I worked on my PhD at the University of Texas, uh, where I focused on rhetoric and composition, specifically in the rhetoric of games and media. Uh, I've presented both nationally and internationally. I have published book chapters, articles, and most recently a book called The Composition of Video Games. And I am currently doing research into games and education, games and gender, player identification, ludology, and the rhetorics of play. And what we're gonna be talking about today are broadly theories of gaming pedagogy. We're going to take a trip down memory lane, if you will. Uh, we're gonna look at kind of these theories have evolved over the last uh, 20 years or so. We're going to be looking at gamification versus game-based learning, learning uh, which are two concepts that are often used interchangeably, uh, but they're actually not quite the same thing. So we'll be comparing, contrasting those two terms. Uh, we will be looking at how to integrate games into the curriculum. Specifically, uh, we're gonna be looking at video games. Uh, we're going to be gamifying the curriculum or at least setting the foundation for how to gamify the curriculum. Uh, let's admit here. Uh, and uh, we will, at the end, be looking at a couple of games that I have used in some of my face-to-face -face courses uh, to uh, kind of promote rhetorical knowledge, to compare contrast with literature, and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, sadly, I have not yet had the opportunity to implement these kinds of uh, game-based pedagogies into my online learning, but hopefully... Uh, I will have the opportunity to do that starting next semester. So uh, we are going to skip kind of like the background history, the old pedagogies, uh, Vygotsky and all that kind of uh, interactive stuff, Skinner, uh, because that was uh, covered in an earlier talk in the keynote by Francesca Robles, uh, who I think very eloquently summarized the history of gaming uh, pre-James Palkey, and so that's where we're going to pick up when uh, video games and kind of digital game-based learning uh, became a thing. And uh, this began in 2003 when uh, James Palkey, at the time he was a professor of education at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, he had an named Cher, uh, he published a book called What Video Games Have to Teach Us About Learning and Literacy. And admit. And in that book, uh, he describes precisely 36 principles that video games have uh, as part of their design that he thinks could have a lot of benefit if they were implemented into teaching and learning spaces. Um, there are, of course, 36 principles. Uh, here you have four as a highlight. There is the design principle, which in the context of video games means that players become deeply familiar with the design of the text. So, for example, when you have a game like Pac-Man, for a player to really become a good player at Pac-Man, they have to do more than just react to where the ghosts are going. They have to actually internalize 
the routines of the ghost and how, for example, the red ghost is programmed to always chase after Pac-Man, whereas the pink ghost is designed to kind of get up close, but then turn around because that's the, you know, the scaredy cat ghost uh, and how other ghosts are designed to try to do a pincer attack. So if Pac-Man is going this way, uh, the red ghost will be chasing, but another ghost might take another route. And these are all things that players have to internalize, right? And that's what's at the core of the design principle, which in the context of education uh, means that uh, students are expected to become deeply familiar with whatever is being taught, whether it's chemistry, uh, whether it's rhetoric, whether it's math and so on, right? There is an expectation if we were to adhere to this principle of really deep learning. We also have the committed learning principle uh, in which players commit to continually learn. Um, I don't know how many of you in the chat uh, have played video games or play video games, uh, but if you do, I'll, I'll call on Candy Crush, right? That's a game that kind of everyone has. Uh, when you begin playing Candy Crush, all you need to do is swipe and match three, and that's it. You have learned a game mechanic. Yay. But as you move forward, the game becomes more and more complex. Uh, after a couple of stages, they start adding chocolates and stripes, and those chocolates and stripes do different things. And once you master those mechanics, uh, the game throws in a curveball and they start adding uh, jellies. And in order for you to pop those jellies, you need to make sure that they're hit with striped candies and so on. And as you move forward, once you hit stages, you know, four or 5,000, you're going to have learned a lot of mechanics that were not there at the beginning. And so this leads us to what in education we call the I plus one principle, where you need to meet at the students where they are and then challenge them a little bit so that they are continually learning. Uh, Guy also explains the ongoing learning principle in which the game consistently pushes players to learn. So this is the counterpart of the committed learning principle. The committed learning principle focuses on the student's desire to learn or the player's desire to, uh, you know, get good if you're familiar with the meme, whereas the ongoing learning principle focuses on the game's design, encouraging that kind of learning or in the context of curriculum, uh, the design of the class encouraging uh, that kind of consistent learning. Uh, and then we have the multimodal principle, which in the context of video games, of course, uh, means that there are different modalities. We have, for example, in a game like Final Fantasy, uh, text, we have audio, we have visuals, we have mechanics, and each of these things work together in a sort of harmonious way to let the player know, hey, this is what you need to do. And the application of that in the context of education would be, here we have someone else, let's admit, um, that the instructors should have multiple modes of teaching. So they shouldn't just stand there and lecture. There should be some kind of, for example, a written component, as we see here uh, in this PowerPoint, there is text as well, that there might be a visual component, which we also see here in the PowerPoint uh, with images and so on, right? So uh, what this last multimodal principle would imply in the context of teaching and learning is that as an instructor, you would need to have more than just your lecture or your story. Now, these are just four of the 36 principles that uh, Guy first proposed in 2003. Uh, but if you want to do a further reading, I'm going to link a short summary of these principles in the chat. And you can go ahead and click on that and uh, read at your leisure, uh, go over the whole 36 principles and see if you kind of vibe with them. Now, this was in 2003. For some of you, this is ages ago, um, but he is the one that kicked off the modern age of education research and, and gaming uh, research and education. And since then, you have had scholars like Kurt Squire, 
uh, who wrote a piece called Video Games and Education for the International Journal of Intelligence Simulations, uh, where he made the argument, not just for game studies people, but for the educational community as a whole, that, hey, video games are a thing, they're really interesting, there's something that we could look at to model education after, but not just that, they are actually tools that we can use in the classroom to foster learning. So that was one of the earliest uh, kind of sustained long form arguments in favor of using video games in educational context. Uh, in 2005, you have uh, Ian Vogost, who would later uh, become uh, you know, internationally known for his work in gaming rhetoric. Uh, he actually wrote a piece called Video Games and the Future of Education, in which he again theorized ways in which video games could be used in academic contexts. Uh, then you had Mark Prensky, he wrote Don't Bother Me Mom, I'm Learning. Uh, and this is a really interesting book that discusses how children use video games to learn. It's kind of in the same vein as uh, Johnson's book, Everything Bad is Good for You, uh, where he talks about how, uh, you know, trash television, comic books, video games, all these uh, kind of pop culture things that society tells you that, that they're bad, that they actually are not bad, that they help you to learn and develop critical thinking skills, right? So Pransky's book is in that same vein. Um, and at around the same time, you have people in specific disciplines arguing, hey, these video games are cool. Let's do some research. Let's see what happens when you, uh, for example, in my case in 2007, when you put a video game into the language acquisition classroom and let's do a comparison. What happens if you take a group of students through the standard curriculum and then another group of students through the standard curriculum, but we add video games. Uh, let's see what happens, right? And so that kind of research starting to uh, emerge around the mid 2000s. Uh, you had people like theorist Thomas, uh, Christopher Thomas Miller, uh, who published Games, Purpose and Potential in Education, who also discussed ways in which uh, video games can be used uh, in different classrooms. Uh, and Leonard Inetta, uh, who wrote Video Games in Education, why they should be used and how they are being used. So this was uh, more of a description and kind of teaching tips. So you started getting all of these kinds of uh, writings that discuss how video games either were being implemented in the classroom or should be implemented in the classroom. Um, and then that cycles back to James Paul Key again, who in 2008 published a book called Good Video Games Plus Good Learning. Uh, and the core of that book is essentially him saying, all this stuff that's happening, all this research, that's great, but I'm not sure why they're citing me because that's not what I meant. What I meant is that we look at video games, we look at how they're designed, and then we design curriculum in that way. So kind of hinting at gamification, which we'll look at in a little bit. Uh, and in this one, he wrote about 16 principles of good video game-based learning, including the principle of interaction, uh, where he says that communication happens between the player and the game. And if you were to apply that principle to an educational context, it means that there needs to be communication, not just between the student and the teacher, but also between the student and the content being learned. Uh, what is it that science, for example, can teach us? What is it that rhetoric can teach us? How can we engage in conversation with the literature itself? And in that last one, uh, in that last example about literature, we can think back to Roland Barthes' concept of the author is dead, the author being dead, meaning that once something is published, it stops meaning whatever the original author wanted it to mean. And it takes and instead it takes on a whole new meaning based on your experience and your interpretation with the poem or the text or indeed the video game. So there, uh, what Guy is suggesting with the interaction principle is that there needs to be that sort of feedback, that conversation uh, between the content, the text and the reader. Um, there is the principle of agency in which in video games means players have control over the gaming environment, 
which in educational context means that players should have control over their own learning. And what that suggests is a moving away from what we call the traditional banking model of education, where the lecturer just kind of stands there and talks at the students and they do nothing. And instead, we move towards a model that's more interactive, hands-on, uh, where in science, for example, we do experiments. If we're talking about English classes, uh, we don't just listen to what the instructor has to say, but we engage in conversation and class debates, and we do a lot of writing and forum discussions. Uh, it means that in our context right now, in this kind of COVID world, it means that instead of forcing students to be in a certain spot at a certain time to listen to a lecture, that maybe those lectures should be made accessible to students so that they can uh, kind of view them at their own pace. And that's a big uh, thing for me. When I design my own courses, I want to make sure that they are accessible to students, that students can uh, listen to the lectures uh, wherever they are at any time. Uh, it doesn't matter whether they were able to make it to my virtual office hours or not. I'm always uh, making myself available so that the students can have agency and control over their own learning. Uh, and then uh, Guy discusses the uh, principle of uh, a game being pleasantly frustrating, meaning that it should frustrate the player enough to challenge them but they should still have that belief that they can do it. And this is something that designers have gotten better at doing, uh, especially over the last 20 years. Uh, if you go back to some of the earlier games, they were impossible to beat. If you think about, for example, the original Contra game, uh, it gave you three lives and you were a Rambo-like soldier and you needed to mow down an army of enemy soldiers and hardly anyone uh, ever beat it with three lives. Uh, people had to input the Konami code up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, uh, in order to beat the game. And uh, as we get closer to today, uh, we have that games are better at teaching the player how to engage with that game world. And what does that mean for education? It means that we can't just throw a bunch of content at students and have them figure it out. Uh, for example, uh, if you're someone uh, who is going into pre-calc for the first time, uh, something that I've seen a lot of pre-calc instructors do is that they just start with the assumption that all students know about the quadratic equation, about matrices and all this other advanced stuff that usually gets covered halfway into the semester. And of course, here I'm speaking uh, out of my own experience and what my students tell me. Uh, but making a class pleasantly frustrating means challenging the students, not overwhelming them, right? And these are just three of the 16 principles that Guy explores in his book, Good Video Games Plus Good Learning. And I'm going to link some further readings in the chat that go over his principles in a little bit more detail. Uh, I should note that I am not linking the full texts here. Uh, that would be a breach of copyright and we don't wanna do that. Uh, but these readings that I am linking are good enough at conveying the general concepts of the books that we're kind of going over, right? So Guy says, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Research is fine, but here's what I want to focus on. So please stop quoting me. Um, and then as the community educators don't care, like Mark Pransky doesn't care. I don't care. We're still quoting Guy because it's a really good foundation for kind of digital game-based learning. Uh, but Mark Pransky, uh, expands on the previous research and says, you know what, integrating games, that's great. Looking at games for inspiration, that's also great. Uh, why don't we just do all of it, right? So going back to that meme, why not both? Uh, so he writes Digital Game-Based Learning, a book in which he raises the questions of what role do games have in professional training? So for example, uh, when someone is training uh, for medical school to be a doctor, are there any kind of video games that they might use? 
to so they can master surgery skills are there any kind of for example stock market simulators or economic simulations uh, that students can use or that you know new hires can use in companies uh, to master the mechanics of those systems. Uh, he questions how can games be used in the classroom, of course, and he does a couple of case studies uh, in his text. He talks about the effects that games have on the learner, whether playing video games makes them more amenable towards the content itself or not. Uh, he talks about whether uh, games change the mechanics of teaching and learning, right? So if you're an instructor, who wants to implement games, does that fundamentally change what you do? Uh, who are digital natives? Of course, that would be uh, some of the kind of younger millennials, Gen C for sure, uh, and now Gen Alpha. These are the people who, uh, in one of the earlier talks, uh, Francesca referred to as being born with a cell phone in their hand. Uh, but if we're being honest, this could be anyone born around the 1990s onward, right? The digital natives. Um, so Prinsky kind of explores that concept uh, as well as why video games are so engaging and most importantly, how to evaluate games for learning. Because something that's important for us to know as instructors is that we can't just throw a video game into a class uh, and call it a day. We need to figure out what games are the ones that are best suited for what we're teaching. And we're gonna look at those specific questions uh, later. And so following up on this kind of uh, trend in thought, H.J. Uh, Brown published a book, an anthology rather, called Video Games in Education, in which he explores video games in a lot of contexts specifically he looks at video games and storytelling how can video games be used to tell stories how do they convey ideas video games and aesthetics which has to do more uh with the visual design of video games i don't know how many of you for example are familiar with fortnite and PUBG. those two are some of the most popular uh kind of arena royale games right now i i, I just forgot the actual name of the uh, genre, but you know, it's kind of like a free for all. You get a hundred players thrown into a map, uh, and then whoever's alive at the end wins, right? And these two games, Fortnite and PUBG, have very different aesthetics. While Fortnite looks a lot like cartoony with a lot of kind of blocky angles, it looks very lighthearted. PUBG looks a lot more serious, grim, it uses kind of dark browns and grays. And if we're looking at it through a lens of visual rhetoric, then we need to question, well, what does this do for the player, these different aesthetics? Uh, and indeed, who is the intended player for each of these games? Um, Brown looks at video games uh, in the context of film studies. So he compares, for example, things like camera angles, how video games borrow from films, and then eventually films borrow back again from video games. And a really good example of this is uh, Run, Lola, Run. It's a movie from 1999 uh, that features a, it's a time loop movie, kind of like Groundhog Day. Uh, but this one features a young woman called Lola. She has to run through, um, I, I believe it's Berlin, uh, and do certain actions in a certain order to save her boyfriend from death. And that is something that we see in video games, right? Having to do something in a certain order in order to succeed. And what happens in a video game? If you fail, you die and you go back to the beginning. And that is what we see in Run, Lola, Run. Uh, the movie doesn't wait until the end of the day, uh, unlike other time loop films. Instead, whenever, for example, Lola dies or uh, if Lola does something incorrectly, then she gets reset. And it's not to the beginning of the day, but rather to the beginning of, you know, her quest, which begins with uh, a phone call. Uh, so, so that's a really interesting comparison there. Um, in the book, they also talk about video games and politics because uh, video games do tackle political issues, whether they are things as simple as what should a city design be like? Uh, you know, some video games, for example, City Skylines Frame, 
these big metropolises like New York City as the desirable. Uh, and if you, for example, wanted to build a small suburb or, or a kind of farming community in these games, then you would get the loose state. So, you know, that's a political issue right in itself. Uh, or you could get things more like partisan politics, where you have video games that look at the election and you choose a candidate and then you uh, travel around the country trying to persuade people to vote for you, right? So uh, these are things that are very intertwined with games. They look at uh, the ethics of video games, not just in the context of the video game industry, but also on how video games encourage players to act. Uh, for example, uh, in Grand Theft Auto, you have uh, a lot of, uh, you know, gray area sort of moral questions as you play through the story. And then, of course, if you decide to use it as a kind of sandbox murder simulator, then you're just, you know, breaking away from all the quote unquote good ethical decisions. Uh, but there are other games like, for example, Dante's Inferno that force you to question your own personal ethics as you move through the labyrinth. Uh, and yes, that was Dante's Inferno as in a video game adaptation of the epic poem from the 11th century. Uh, he discusses in this book, religion and video games, video games and history, and then, of course, the video game community. So it, it's pretty much the next step on that why not both question that Prensky raises in game-based learning. And as we move forward, we start seeing these other forms of, of kind of synergy between video games and education. Uh, for example, the concept of tangential learning, which uh, Daniel Floyd says uh, is the process by which gamers learn things out of their own personal interest. But these are things that they are exposed to through video games. And in his discussion about tangential learning, Daniel Floyd says that the character that we see here in the bottom right, Sephiroth from Final Fantasy VII, is a great example of tangential learning. Uh, he argues, because uh, I'm, I'm not sure that I agree with the Sephiroth example that he uses, but he argues that when players learn about Sephiroth, they look him up, they try to research the origins of Sephiroth, and then they discover that uh, the word itself references a kind of sacred tree of life uh, that has biblical origins. Uh, so that's his example of tangential learning, but I actually think that there are far better examples of tangential learning out there. Uh, for example, we have the SimCity games in which you take the role of a mayor and you start controlling policy, taxes, uh, you start kind of ushering the economy in a certain way, trying to create a successful city. And as you play through these games, you become interested in governance, or, or rather you might become interested in governance. You might go outside of the game and do research. Uh, another great example is, of course, Oregon Trail, uh, in which players just guide a caravan of people through the Oregon Trail. You're trying to get to Oregon uh, without dying of dysentery, if you will, right? That's the big meme. Uh, but it's an educational game at its core. It's a game to prompt players to research more about what uh, colonial life was in early America. Uh, Never Alone is possibly one of the best examples of this kind of learning. Uh, it's a game where you, the player, takes control of an Eskimo character. Uh, she has a wolf that kind of helps her throughout the journey. And it's a really nice looking platformer game. But in between, if you want to get all of the game's achievements, you have to go back to the gallery and look at videos that are essentially documentaries about the Eskimo culture, uh, their mythologies and religions and their histories and all that kind of good stuff. And a lot of people have gotten curious and just continued doing research past what the game explains. And then of course, Paper Please is a great example of a game that serves this tangential learning process. 
Uh, this one's a game where you take the role of an immigration uh, border officer and you have to look at people and figure out if they are cleared to come into your country or not. Uh, but depending on who you let through, they might actually be someone who's against the state. Uh, they might engage in, in kind of murder, violence, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and this game has led people to study more about kind of the politics of the Eastern Bloc in Europe, where the game is set, uh, even though the nation in the game is a fictional one, and so on, right? So tangential learning is about getting someone interested in the topic that's presented in the game so that they can do their own research afterwards. And then uh, we had gamification, uh, which is a term that maybe might have been coined in 2002 by a British computer designer called Nick Pelling. Uh, but I put that in a question mark because the first actual recorded use of the word goes back to 2007, a post by this guy called uh, Brett Terrell, uh, who wrote about gamification. Uh, once the concept started gaining popularity with Jane McGonagall's book on, to, on uh, 2011, Reality is Broken, and with her uh, amazing TED Talks, then Nick Pelling wrote a blog post saying, oh, but that's a word that I used back in the day. I opened up a company, and then I called it gamification, but then we went under, and we went bankrupt, and I didn't care about it at all. Uh, but broadly speaking, uh, people credit him with that, though, because it wasn't recorded. As a scholar, I'm not sure how much I can uh, agree with that. So my argument would be that the coining of the term actually belongs to Brett Terrell, and the popularization of the concept definitely goes back to uh, Jim McGonagall. All right, and gamification is about adding a gamic layer on top of a non-gaming activity. Like for example, uh, in the context of education, we have classes, we have tests, essays, and so on. And we're all familiar with the kind of grading system that's like, you know, 90%, you get an A, 80%, you get a B, et cetera, et cetera. Well, a gamified form of assessment would involve either a points-based system or an experience-based system uh, where students kind of level up. And if they hit a certain level, let's say, you know, a student gets to level five, then that's a C. If they get to level six, then that's a B and so on and so forth. And what the students see is that leveling up and experience point kind of process. But then in the back end, the instructor is actually keeping track of percentages um, and all that good stuff. Uh, and if you set the foundation for gamification early on, you can have a really cool course as you move forward, which is what we're going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, but first, I want to go over the differences between game-based learning and gamification, right? Like we already mentioned uh, just now, uh, gamification is a kind of advocation of game-like elements in non-gamic spaces to promote behaviors that lead to outcomes. In other words, if I want my students to uh, you know, turning the essay by a certain date, then I can give them a badge or like a token, an achievement coin, if you will. And then they can display that achievement virtually in their profile. Whereas game-based learning is an instructional method that's more purposeful and uses games to teach a specific outcome. Uh, in other words, under game-based learning, we are using games to teach and learn, whereas under gamification, we are using game-like components to motivate people to learn. In one, we learn through play, and in the other one, we learn through whatever means, but we are incentivized to do so through play-like mechanics, right? Uh, gamification often includes achievements, badges, that kind of stuff, maybe a leaderboard, uh, whereas game-based learning, uh, the whole class could be a game. An example of this, I remember when I was teaching uh, English as a second language uh, in Puerto Rico, uh, I turned one class into a full-blown scavenger hunt. Uh, the night previous, I hid a bunch of clues throughout the institution, of course, with the permission of the administration. And then on that day, uh, students came in 
Uh, and I said, you know what, today I'm just going to be here, but you guys are not. Here are your clues. Go scavenger hunting. And as the students went through the campus, they had to uh, solve puzzles and riddles and clues and have conversations with other faculty um, in order to find the ultimate prize at the end, which was an A uh, for any test that they wanted that semester. Um, so that's the difference between game-based learning and gamification. Uh, gamification is essentially an encouragement mechanic, whereas game-based learning it is content itself, right? The game is the content. And in gamification, you can implement that in both educational and commercial spaces, whereas game-based learning is largely something that happens in educational context, but sometimes you can see it in corporate context and job training and so on. Uh, it's something that I think... Uh, should be done more in these other kinds of settings, corporate training, et cetera. Uh, but sadly, uh, a lot of people who talk about game-based learning in these contexts are actually just selling gamification and not game-based learning. So how do you gamify your course? Uh, this one is uh, for instructors. You want to start by setting the foundation. Right. This is a syllabus that uh, I created for a course that I will be uh, teaching, hopefully, uh, either during summer or uh, at a later uh, date on campus. And you'll notice that right off the bat, there are gaming aesthetics. We have, it's dangerous to go alone, take this. Uh, that's a classic scene from the original Zelda game, The Legend of Zelda for the uh, NES. But if you look closely, you'll notice that we don't have a sword here. We have a little document, which in the game was a map, but of course, in the context of this syllabus, would be the syllabus itself. Uh, we see that we have a game-like font uh, for the headings, course description, course objectives, and so on. Uh, and we see that the grading assessment focuses on experience points not on percentages. Uh, and as students complete tasks, uh, being those tasks being the major papers and the short assignments, they earn points. So everyone starts at zero. And as they increase that experience bar, right, that quote unquote experience bar, they might earn up to 120 points in each of the major papers and up to 600 points for the short assignments. And you'll notice that as they gain experience, uh, their grade increases. So they start with a zero, but as soon as they hit 600 points, that's a D. As soon as they hit 700 points, that's a C, right? And just like in video games, students cannot lose those points. So it's transparent. They know exactly where they stand at each point of the course. Um, some of you might have noticed that the total of the course is 1,200 points, but to earn an A, students need 900 points, uh, meaning that we are breaking away from that kind of 90%, 80%, et cetera, kind of uh, structure. In order to get an A in this model, you don't need 90%. It's closer to something like 85, maybe 80%. Uh, and why did I build it like that? Because if you think about games, especially uh, more modern kind of open world games, or indeed even in The Legend of Zelda, you have an open space. You can explore. You can choose to either do or not do something in the game. And so I like to keep that in mind in class, in, in my curriculum design, to the point where students can choose which assignments to do in order to get an A. So maybe there's a student who is shy about participating, but they're really good about writing, critical thinking, analysis. And so that student might wanna get the bulk of his points through the major papers, then do a couple of short assignments and voila, they have that A. Other students might be uh, more open to uh, participation, 
uh, in class so they can earn most of their points through participation. But then if they really want to hit, you know, that high C, that B, that A, then they actually have to work through the long form essays. And you'll notice that um, it doesn't matter how active a student is in class, the most that they can get out of it using this model that I have here is 600 points. So to get to that C, they will need to submit at least one paper, and that is assuming that they do all of the in-class activities perfectly, right? Uh, so if they want to get to that A, they need to submit at least three papers, and then if you frame those papers as kind of gamified activities and you make them thorough with transparent instructions and uh, key checkpoints, uh, students will do fine. They will meet all of the uh, criteria for the course, et cetera. All right. Uh, the same is true for class activities. You can uh, gamify them. So instead of having a kind of basic review where you ask students questions, uh, you can have them uh, do a gamified debate where students choose if to debate or not, or maybe they agree with whoever posited uh, the previous uh, solution. So this example that we have here is a kind of game system where students will be separated into different groups and I will pose them a question. So I'll ask group number one, for example, uh, what is logos? Group number one will posit an answer and then I'll ask group number two, do you agree with that? If they agree, then we move on to group number three, do you agree with that? And if all of the groups agree, then the members of group number one, they get a point. If at any point anyone disagrees, then we have a debate. So each team will be able to prepare, present their arguments to class, and then class will vote. And at the end, whichever team wins that debate gets the point. Then we move on to the second group. They get a question, you know, what's Kairos? And they'll posit an answer. And then group number two will either agree or disagree and so on. So it's a kind of round robin gamified debate uh, where students can kind of learn off each other. And here we are starting to shift into game-based learning where the game itself uh, leads to engagement with the content and learning. Uh, another thing that I like to do is using Jenga in my face-to-face -face classes. Uh, this variation is one that I haven't talked about before, uh, but it's one where you have your Jenga towers and then you have prompts on the blocks themselves. And as students pull blocks, they have to read the prompt and then they either have to write what's in the prompt or discuss what's in the prompt. This is really great for uh, when you're having uh, kind of debate classes or for short written exercises. And if at any point a student kind of knocks down a tower, then you can uh, play around with house rules and add penalties. Maybe if a student knocks down the whole tower, then they have to write 10 prompts instead of one, that kind of stuff, All right? So what about using games in class, actual games? Uh, first, you need to know how to evaluate the games. So you want to ask yourself if the game is well designed, if it's engaging, what's the underlying message? As we've already talked about, a lot of games have messages and ideologies embedded into them. Uh, this is something that Ian Bogus discusses at length in his work and that indeed in my own book, uh, The Composition of Games, I, I talk about extensively. Uh, you want to consider what do games teach, right? For me, as an English instructor, uh, there would be very little point for me to use, for example, Oregon Trail. That's something that might lean more towards history. Um, or even if the game teaches anything other than to play itself. If you think back to, for example, games like Kung Fu or Karate Champ, even though those games were good at teaching the player how to play, they don't really teach anything beyond that. They don't have uh, much of an embedded ideology or a message. They're not that rhetorical. Uh, they were just meant to have fun. Tetris is the great, the great example for this kind of game that uh, just kind of gets you in a Zen-like state with a high awareness level, but it doesn't really have any kind of... Um, you know, message beyond here are some blocks uh, and then just get them together. Even though some people have argued that it does, I'm not so sure that's uh, the case. Um, and you want to think about what discussions can be had in class 
based on the games? And most importantly, do the students want to play? Because going back to Daniel Floyd, uh, you can't just force someone to play a game and expect them to learn something if they don't care about that game at all. Uh, the prime example is, is I'm going to use my, my son here. I've wanted him to play Final Fantasy for the longest. That's my favorite video game franchise. Uh, it's been for the longest time. Uh, he hates it. He hates it. Uh, his favorite franchise is Pokemon. So what I did uh, when he was learning to read is I got him all the Pokemon games, all the RPGs, and then at, after each play session, I would ask him, okay, so what did you learn about Pokemon? You know, like, what's the story about? What are you doing in the game so far? Um, and eventually I ended up writing a book for him uh, when Twitch Plays Pokemon became a big thing. So I wrote the Twitch Plays Pokemon novel um, and he read that uh, in one sitting and, and he was laughing, he was having a hoot, right? So that's an example of using a game that a student, in this case, my kid is interested in, uh, and using that as a, a way to uh, foster learning, right? Now, some uh, games that might be interesting for you to consider uh, are games like Plague Inc. I'm gonna put the link to that one uh, in the chat. And this is a game in which you are a plague, a virus, and your purpose is to infect everyone in the world. And there are a couple of other games that I would like to share with you. Let me pull up my browser here, all right? So now we're in the game make section of this talk. We have uh, only a few minutes left. So let me just kind of go over these uh, really quickly. And I'll also post the links in the chat. Uh, this is Republia Times. It's a game about censorship in which you take the role of a newspaper editor and what you are expected to do is censor news that are not favorable to the state and publish news that are good for the state. So you're expected to self-censor, to engage in self-censorship if you want to stay alive. And why would a player do this? Why wouldn't a player just revolt against the system and, you know, down with the state? Because according to the game's narrative, the state has her family. And if you don't play ball, uh, well, you know, bad things can happen. Uh, a more detailed version of this with more of a story is the Westport Independent, which you can get for Android, I think for Apple as well, for iOS. Uh, and it is uh, on the PC as well. You can find it on Steam. Uh, and this one has, as you can see, a more detailed aesthetic. Uh, you have more active involvement in what you choose to censor or not. Uh, Depression Quest is an interesting game that explores the psychology of someone who suffers uh, depression. Uh, this one was created by game designer Zoe Quinn. Uh, and it's more like interactive fiction. So as you read through the story, you are told as a reader what you're feeling, right? So as you walk home, the stress from the uh, rainfall gets to you and finally you get home and what do you want to do? Uh, do you want to sit down on your desk and try to work? Do you want to just turn on the television? Do you want to crawl into bed? And depending on the choices that you make, the game tells you the outcome. Okay, so this is what you as a person with depression would go through. Uh, let's see, we have already linked play game. Uh, we have Logomancer. This one is an interesting video game about rhetoric in which when you combat your enemies, you don't use attack, magic, and all that kind of stuff. Instead, uh, you use rhetorical techniques, you use uh, equivocation, you use common sense, and so on. It, it's really interesting. Um, and it's one that uh, if you have a chance, there we go on the chat, uh, you should play. And then to plug one of my own, uh, this is The Rime of the Ancient Mariner. Uh, this is a game that's uh, a little bit um, anachronistic, if you will. Uh, you begin by controlling 
um, Alexander Pope, uh, a 18th century poet, and he's reading The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, which if you are a lit person, you know it's impossible because Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner was written well after Pope died. But in this game, I decided, you know what, time vortex, Pope uh, historically went to a library and he read every book until he went blind. So let's just throw in there the rhyme of the ancient mariner. And once Pope, you as a player being Pope, uh, picks up the rhyme of the ancient mariner, you are teleported into the shoes of the wedding guest from the poem itself. And you are stopped by the ancient mariner who tells you his story. And then you are again teleported one level deep into the shoes of the mariner and you get to uh, play out all of the things that happen in the poem. Uh, you know, there's the albatross and then you shoot the albatross and you're forced to wear it on your neck and all of the things that are depicted in the poem uh, we see uh, being made manifest here in the game. So I'm going to link that here as well. All right. And Branches of Power is a really interesting one for uh, those of you who are taking government courses or teaching government courses. Uh, it's one where you take control of the three branches of government uh, and you try to pass legislation based on an agenda, but you get pushback from the system itself. And you can play that one in Android. And I think there's a version for PC as well. Uh, but I don't know if it's still active. I used to have a far longer list of games, uh, but I don't know how many of you are aware. Uh, you know, at the end of last year, uh, every browser decided to stop supporting Flash. And so just like that, a lot of the games that I had on this uh, list to kind of share with you, uh, games that lead to, you know, kind of fun educational activities, they stopped working. Um, but... Uh, those are just some of the games that uh, you can use for education. And uh, there are certainly a lot more that you can use. I actually have a folder called Literary Gaming in my computer. I have games like Elegy for a Dead World. That's a game about writing poetry inspired by the, wor the works of the romantic poets, Keats, Shelley, uh, Byron Blake, etc., uh, we have Kind Words, where it's a game that you kind of shout into the void and strangers answer uh, to your complaints, right? So if you're ever frustrated with something, you can write a letter to strangers. I'm so frustrated. Here's what's happening. And they will get back to you. And so this game is kind of like a, a, a stimulant for good mental health. Uh, you have games like Project Hospital and COVID The Outbreak, which are uh, about managing a hospital and about how to try to manage the COVID outbreak um, and so on. To be or not to be, it's a really interesting game based on Shakespeare, of course, right? So uh, that's have been it for me. Uh, we're almost out of time. Any questions, you can put them in a the chat or you can unmute yourself and uh, let me know. Any questions? All right, and here are some other really great resources about games and learning. These are five books published by the ETC Press at Carnegie Mellon. I'm going to drop those links there and you can peruse them uh, at your discretion. All right, so that has been me for today. Uh, if you have any questions, you can always email me. Uh, have a good one and uh, I will see you around.